I also have people requesting to pray for Ohio State to win tomorrow <laughs> night. And uh, that's a personal prayer. Okay. We can't have corporate prayer for Ohio State. But I think they're going to win anyways, right? Uh, we're starting a new series here called uh, Living a Generous Life. And um, don't panic. It's, it's not a fundraising campaign. Um, and uh, although if we get to it, I started looking at this message and, and I started thinking, um, wow, this might be... I might have uh, gotten too much into one Sunday. So we'll see how far we get, okay? Because I'd rather kind of do it well, amen, rather than just kind of fly through it. So we'll see where we get to here. But uh, our power verse from the New Living Translation, for God, on page, top of page two, for God so loved the world that he gave us one and only son that everyone who believes him will not perish but have eternal life. And the big bold letters, for God so loved the world that he gave. And so when we talk about being generous people and living generously and giving generously, um, and I want to stress the living generously. Giving is only a part of living. Amen? It, you know, it's not, generosity is not only about what you do with your wallet. I mean, it's definitely connected to that. Um, but we're talking about living a generous life. And I think this other verse connects with that. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I came, Jesus is saying, I have come that you might have life and enjoy life and have it in super abundance to the full till it overflows. So God's design for us is to have a super Abundant life. That's what Jesus wants for us. And so, you know, our motto is make life better. And that is not about a personal quest for us to have a nice car and a nice house and nice clothes and, you know, more than enough of whatever and a long retirement and a vacation house. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. Amen? That's all stuff. And, you know, you live your life with God and you talk to him about what you buy and what you don't buy and what you invest in and what you don't invest in, you know, we are not against stuff. We are against loving stuff. That's what the Bible says. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. That's what gets people in big troubles when they start loving money. So we want to not be trying to get stuff for ourselves, but we want to get get things in our lives, stuff and other things we're going to talk about in a minute, so we can give it away, so we can pour it into other people's lives. And that's how they get blessed, and that's how their lives get changed. And they can also catch the same kind of attitude, the same kind of lifestyle, and they can start doing the same thing. I would, you know, mention this whenever I get into something that's talking about giving or living generously, what if, what if every Christian, just the Christians, what if every Christian on the planet tithed? Welfare would be gone. And I just think that's such a great thing that we could strive for, that we, because, you know, it was always the churches. It was first, it was families and then it was churches and then communities that took care of people that were in distress. And now we've kind of abdicated our position and we've given it to the government to do. And they're not very efficient at it. And they're not very close to the people that need the help. And so sometimes the government gets scammed. Or some of you believe most of the time the governments get scammed. And we tend to, we tend to put people in a position where... Um, they feel like they're entitled to this lifestyle and it actually imprisons them from being everything that they're called to be. And, you know, that's why we need to take back the benevolence of this world. But it's going to mean that all the Christians are going to have to decide, yeah, I want to be a, a generous person. So 
how I, I, we'll do the, the drawings kind of slow, but it'll catch up as we're talking about this. Um, there are different things that you can give away uh, in life. And as I was praying about this, I think I've really kind of added some areas. I think one place that you can give away is your soul. Uh, an another place that you've got is um, time and vitality. This is another resource that you have that you can give away to people. You've got uh, gifts and talents and abilities. You've got wisdom and knowledge. It's another resource that we have to give away in our, in our life. Uh, yeah, you've got money and things, stuff. It's another resource that, that we have. And here's one you may not think of. This will upset some of the people that I'm related to. You have a resource in your children that you can target. The Bible actually says that your children are arrows that you can target and shoot in the life. Isn't that cool? And so we've got all the resources. Many of these are renewable. Children are a renewable resource. You can have more of them. You can adopt them, right? You can go out and find people that need mentors, right? So this is a renewable resource. You can go out and you can bring these people into your life and you can pour your life into their life. Uh, your soul is a renewable resource, amen? You can pour life into your soul. The Bible teaches us that, you know, when we pour Jesus Christ into our life, when we pour the word into our life, our soul becomes stronger, more powerful, more viable. Uh, and you got to connect and blend some of these things together. Like these two definitely go together when um, you're having relationships. Just spending time with somebody doesn't do it, does it? You can be in the same room with a person. Are you really pouring your time into this person? Or are you just taking up space? So, yes, you have to actually be in the room. You have to invest the time, but you've got to invest part of your soul and who you are in that person and loving that person and caring about that person and interacting with that person, you know, and having a relationship so we can take some of these things and put them together. Um, I think that time is tricky because it's not really a renewable resource, but we do know that we can redeem time by pointing people towards eternity because eternity is endless. So time is kind of a renewable resource in that sense. But vitality is important that we take care of ourselves and, and that uh, you know mentally and physically um, that, that we're taking care of ourselves emotionally so that when we go to interact with people, we have something to pour into their lives rather than suck it out of them. Amen? Because you've been, have you been around people that are suckers? And we don't want to be those people that are pulling the life out of other people. We want to be the people that are pouring life in. We want to be generously giving of our soul, but you have to be connected to the Holy Spirit and that river of life pouring into you so you can pour it back out again. So we need that, that infusion in our soul and the, in our time and our vitality. And then we all have gifts and, and talents and abilities. And, and there, there's different levels of these. You know, if like our basketball team, they're just adorable and, uh, we only, we're not very good, okay? Like, I'm jealous of Ben and Erica's team because they're coaching a team and they got basketball players, okay? And I've got a couple of basketball players, but when my team first showed up and, uh, and, and I said, okay, let's shoot layups. 
and nobody made one. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh. Because some of them couldn't even dribble. And we're learning, you dribble the ball, and you can't pick it up, and then dribble again. That's double dribble. I mean, this is what we're, that's what I'm teaching my players, okay? So we're not going to win. I mean, I'm happy when we score, okay? I mean, that's, so you've got different levels of player, you know? So you've got people down here like this, and then you've got people that are LeBron James and Michael Jordan and, uh, you know, if it was some other field, you know, uh, Paul McCartney. How many of you know who Paul McCartney is? This is, how many of you don't know who Paul McCartney is? Okay, this is really funny because uh, Kanye West cut a song with Paul McCartney and it blew up on Twitter. And they're saying, all these Con- Kanye West fans are saying, who is this Paul McCartney dude? <laughs> Kanye West is going to make Paul McCartney. This guy is going to sell so many records because of Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney has sold, what, two billion records worldwide over his life, okay? So, you know, I mean, he's one of the original Beatles. And here's the whole culture that's just like, who is Paul McCartney? (laughs) And I'm like, who is Kanye West? (laughs) (laughs) But... But here's my point. If LeBron James and Michael Jordan never picked up a basketball in their life, what happens? They stink at basketball. They can have all the latent ability and talent in the world, but if you don't practice, it's never going to come out. It's never going to get better. Uh, Paul McCartney you know, if he doesn't pick up a guitar and practice, it's not going to be good. And so we have all this renewable resource that, that, of, of abilities and talents. And you may have a ceiling. You know, some of my kids, if they practice and practice and practice, they're never going to get any better than, you know, some people where they start. It's just, but you can, by force of will, you can become semi-competent at some things. Even if it's not your latent skill. Are you with me? Woodworking, I love woodworking, but it's something I have to, you know, I just don't pick up a piece of wood and then it comes out the way I want it to. I have to look at it and think about it, plan, start cutting things, plan again, you know, I've got two or three board stretchers. Um, I mean, I love doing it, but it's not what I do best. But I can make stuff that comes out pretty good. But i got to work and practice and think. And over the years, I've gotten decent at it. But there are other people that just, you know, they just got the gift. They got the skill. And they pick up a piece of wood and it turns into this beautiful thing. They... I was watching a woodworking show the other day and these little kids, you know, they're 14 years old and they're making this like master furniture, master craft furniture. And I'm going, jeez, you know, uh, 14 years old. I'll never make anything that nice. But it's, but I can, you, you know what I'm saying? By force of will, just by de- being determined, you can raise your level of skill somewhere, knowledge you can raise your level of knowledge about something. You can get smarter. You can learn things. You can, you know, some people look at the Bible and get intimidated, but you know, if you keep reading it and reading it and reading it, you'll get smarter. Nobody understands math when they start out. Everybody looks at the plus sign when you're a little kid and goes, Pfft. you know, mom and dad says, now what's that mean, Joey? I don't know. <laughs> that means addition. What's that mean, mommy? That means plus. What's that mean? They, you know, two apples and two apples equal four apples. You blew my mind, okay? <laughs> but we, two plus two equals four is just basic, you know, everybody understands that now. 
But at one point, you didn't. So you learn, you learn, you grow, you learn. And you're going to hit a ceiling somewhere. I heard Mike and Mike talking the other day when Mike Gullick said he walked in the statistical analysis in college, you know, and they had those chalkboards that slide up and down and that were just filled with numbers. And that kept sliding them up and down. He kept looking at them thinking, you know, I'm in the wrong place because it looks like a foreign language to me. And, you know, yeah, hey, you'll hit a ceiling somewhere where, you know, it's going to take you so much time to figure it out. Like, I'm really good at, I pick up almost anything, but you throw a foreign language at me, I mean, you might as well throw a two-ton bowling ball my way. I cannot handle that. It just, so I have to work at languages. I work at languages. When I was in college, I took Greek. When I got to seminary, I didn't tell them. I said, I am a novice. I know nothing about Greek, which is basically true because I can't retain anything on these foreign languages. I could still use them today because of force of will. That's, that's, that's how I got through Hebrew. Every night I was in there, my wife, I don't know if she remembers or not, because she was trying to take care of Christy who had colic. And, and I'd been there, what do you mean she still does? Okay, so I'd be in there grinding out, you know, looking up every word in the Hebrew, you know. Hebrew is not fair. They don't just change the back of the word, they change the front of the word. You, I mean, you've got to know your roots by memory. It's not fair. So you do, I'm looking through the dictionary, flipping through, trying to find this word. You know, I find it, you know. So I had all A's going in the final in Hebrew and flunked the final because I could not find the words fast enough. That's, you know, that was how I did the Hebrew. I get the dictionary out. <laughs> hey, there is so much that we can do with our lives, though, Right? You've got some natural talents and abilities, the ones that are kind of comes easy. Man, you start pouring some time and effort into that, you can be LeBron James, you can be Michael Jordan, you can be Paul McCartney and whatever it is that you do well. And there's lots of places where we can do those things. I was just making a list of, of things because I was thinking, you know, God made us um, with creativity in mind. And, you know, he's a creative God, and he put creativity in us, and then he put us in the garden, and he, he, said, uh, he said, you know, go and make the world a garden. And, and, and I think that means a lot of things. I think that means invention and creating things that people like to eat. Like, I think, you know... I was watching this cooking show yesterday, and like I channel surf between things. Like I watch a, a football play, and then I back to the cooking show, or I watch a football play, and I'm back to the um, woodworking show, and I'm going like this. You know, it drives my wife nuts. I can multitask. I can watch four television shows at the one time, listen to music, write something, and read a book. Okay. That's just how my brain works. And if all that thing's not going on, I get bored. So I'm doing all this stuff, and, and I see this cooking where, and I thought, wow, isn't it awesome how God gave somebody like this person the ability to make this loaf of bread? It's so awesome. I would never do that. I would never spend three hours to make a loaf of bread I could eat in 10 minutes. <laughs> they start talking about time, and then you got to wait. Then you got to wait. I'm going, this is not my thing. I'm going to do the woodworking. You don't really have to wait for the wood to do anything. I mean, when you finish it, okay. But the rest of the time, you just get to work with it. And I'm thinking, wow, but isn't it cool what they can do and they can make the blessed people and make their lives better. And through, you know, just through cooking and there's, there's uh, farmers who feed the world. I mean, this is a little more practical. Um, farming engineering, I'm not going to try to write engineering, uh, engineering is an awesome thing. If we took you to India and you rode on their roads, you would be so happy you live here. Their cars are junk because the roads are horrible and it beats the cars to pieces. And so we have, the, we have engineering, we have invention. We have electricity that you can count on. 
you know, the, the, we're probably going back to India here next, next January in 2016 to John Joseph's part of the country uh, where the electricity comes on for a few hours in the evening. Refrigerators are not good that way, right? The electricity needs to be on all the time. We, we're blessed. We have electricity on. We have furnaces. Aren't furnaces nice? Aren't you glad you got a furnace this week? It's, it's such a blessing. And, and, and people invent and create things, and we make the world a better place, you know, physically. But there's so much more that we can do with a generous life in pouring into people's lives through discipleship and, and through mentoring and by uh, helping people out of hard situations and, and by blessing people so they can have joy in their life. You with me? That's really what I want to talk about the next few weeks, how we can, how we can increase you know, what we have in our lives so we can give, it, give away more into, into other people. Uh, look at page three there. I think this is kind of uh, interesting. It says, uh, this is Jesus teaching in Matthew chapter five, and this is the message version. So this is not a translation. This is what you would call a transliteration or, or actually more of a paraphrase. They're trying to get the sense of what Jesus is saying across in our modern language. If someone drags you into court and sues for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant's life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. You're familiar with the old written law. And, and in the original translation, that's where Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. So that's, they're, they're making that into, you're familiar with the old written law, love your friends and its unwritten companion, hate your enemies. I'm challenging that. Jesus says, I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer. For then you are working out of your true self, your God-created selves. And I love that part of the translation, your God-created selves. Not the old fallen nature, right? Because what's the old fallen nature do? You know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, you mess with me, I'm going to get you back worse. And so we want that God created itself. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm, the rain to nourish, to everyone, regardless, the good, the bad, the nice, and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Oh, that's a great phrase. Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others. It's the way God lives towards you. Amen? Isn't that cool? I just think that God, Jesus is teaching us that we're different now since he showed up. And we're not going to run by the old fallen nature. We're not trapped in that that lie anymore. The enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and the take from people, you know, that's the old fallen world's way. That's the kingdom of darkness way. But now we're going to have a kingdom of light, and we're going to do it totally different. We're going to be generous, and we're going to give, and we're just going to keep giving to people, even when they irritate us, aggravate us, make us upset, and do things to provoke us. We're just going to give, 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 give. Isn't that cool? I think that's just, we've got an opportunity to be like our heavenly father who gave us, our, gave us his son even when we were in sin and we were contrary to his nature, it says in Romans. That, you know, we were cut off. I mean, the Bible even refers to us as enemies at that point of God. And he chooses, when we're in that condition, to give us his son. For God so loved the world, he gave. And so I, I just see that, and that's what I want to encourage us to the next few weeks as we're thinking about this and talking this through. Um, 
let's go on to page four. I think we'll just take a look at this and then we'll keep going with the rest of it next week. So don't panic. We're not going to get into a 40 minute message. Um, but this on page four is David's post fundraising prayer. He has a big fundraiser for the temple and, uh, and he, he's collecting all the stuff. Solomon is actually going to build the temple, but David is, is collecting all the monies and the gold and the silver and the precious jewels and, and stuff. You know, some of it they're going to use to buy things. Some they're actually going to put into the temple. And the temple turned out to be pretty spectacular. It was a pretty successful fundraiser. Um, the, the, according to the, to the Tyndale Bible Dictionary, by today's standards, it would have been about $11 billion. Pretty good, pretty good fundraiser, right? <laughs> by today's money, $11 billion they raised. Uh, and, uh, and King David gave about a third of it. So, you know, he, he said, he was getting towards the end of his life, he said, I'm just emptying my personal bank accounts and I'm pouring it into this temple. And so he, he says this prayer, and it's really powerful. Uh, then David praised the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. David said, may you be praised, Lord God of our fathers, from eternity to eternity. So immediately, if you put two eternities together, what do you get? A really long time, okay? Um, just one eternity is a long time. So he says, from eternity to eternity. It's just a way of describing God that he's, you know, infinite, that he's endless, that he's the, the ultimate ruler of the universe. Uh, verse 11, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. And he's basically emptying the Hebrew dictionary of all the power words that, that you could describe God with. And he lists them all right there. For everything in the heavens and on the earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand, and it's in your hand to make great and give strength to all. Now, therefore, God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? I mean, he's looking at the 11 billion because it's a physical offering. Think, think metric tons of gold piled up. I mean, it's hard. It blows your mind. It's hard to conceive of. But that's what has happened. They've, they've come physically giving their gold and it's amounted to huge numbers of tons of gold and other metals. Who can give as generously as this? For everything comes from you, and we have given only what comes from your hand. For we live before you as foreigners and temporary residents in your presence, as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without help, hope. Yahweh our God, all this wealth that we've provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand. Everything belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and that you are pleased with what is right. I have willingly given all these things with an upright heart, and now I have seen your people who are present here giving joyfully and willingly to you. And so we'll kind of um, talk about that next week and unfold it, but that's kind of where we're headed. We're looking for how we can see ourselves as givers, and, and granted, that's a money passage, but I really want to go back and think about those other resources that where we can give and that we, we try to let go of those and release those and think in a kingdom perspective. Everything is God's, amen? And the time, especially time, is, you know, that's why I'm trying to stay away from the money a little bit because, you know, we, well, I, Pastor Bob, I earn my money. I work hard for that. And you do. But you don't earn your time, do you? God just gave it to you. So, you know, we got to realize he gives us everything, the money too, the opportunity to make the money, the gifts, the abilities, the skills. He pours that all into us. Um, yes, we make something with it. And, and, we're, and we're supposed to expand our personal economy in all these areas, including money. But 
He gives us time. And so we got to turn around and say, okay, he gave it to me. How can I give back? How can I serve him? And, and how can I live for him? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that I live uh, in a fellowship with generous people. That we're already uh, wonderful givers here. We're generous people with our time and all these other resources, our souls. Uh, we just ask that we want to go to the next level, Father. We, we want to be even more generous. We want to have more so we can give more. We want to make life better like we never have before, Father. So we just ask that you would just work in us and show us how we can accomplish that uh, through the leading of your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and God's people said, amen. amen. All right, we're going to have people up here to pray for you. Next week at leadership training, there is lunch provided and child care, but I need those RSVPs so I can get the right amount of everything together. Um, let's give Matt a big round of applause for playing this morning. We, we appreciate Matt helping Keith out, so Keith doesn't have to be up there every single Sunday, so it's a blessing. So <laughs> Lift your hands, receive the blessing. Father, we ask that you would... Uh, according to your word, that you would just uh, fill us with everything that you want us to have for that abundant life so we can give it away, Father. And we pray that you would cause your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And we receive this blessing in the mighty name of Jesus and God's people said, Amen. Amen. We love you. Have the best week of your life so far.